Rob Dial, it is so good to be with you, brother. Hey, good to be with you too, man. Thanks for being here. So we have a lot of history. Yeah, we have a lot of history. Yeah, a lot of history. I want to start there, right? So um, we uh, we coached together yep. uh, back in 2006. Yep. Yep. 2006. Right. You were my you and and John, John Berghoff were my coaches. Your coaches, man. Yeah. yeah. And what were you doing back then? Uh, you weren't you in, weren't running one of the b- biggest podcasts in the world, no. a coaching program. What were you doing back then? Um, I was a I was a brand new sales rep in Cutco, and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and I realized you guys seemed like you had figured it out. And you seemed like you had your life together, and and I didn't really have any mentors in the business. And I was like, you know what? These guys seem like they know what they're doing. They're both like Hall of Fame reps. I'm going to hire them. Nice. Smart. So you were, you were, you, you understood the power I wanted, of mentorship. I wanted to shorten my learning curve and yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. Now you're the yeah. mindset mentor and you were on the other side of it, right? Being mentored. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in the beginning. It, changed, it changed my life to just be having a call with some person every single week. And even though it was more than I spent, I spent $350 a month in rent, but I spent $500 a month for a coach. And that alone was like, I didn't have the money. I put on a credit card. I'm like, I'm going to figure it out. And that decision of just investing into myself was one of the best decisions I ever made. And you were how old in 2006? I was 19. 19 years old? 19. Right. Yeah. Old. I was when I started selling cut codes. Yeah. Um, and then let's fast forward to 2014. Mm-hmm. You came to the first live event that I ever put on, Best Year Ever Blueprint. Yep. yep. Uh, that John Berghoff and I, how funny too, right? It's your, yeah. your same coach just put on in 2014. Uh, and then at that event, you had an epiphany mm-hmm. that led to the work you're doing now, led to your new book, Level Up, How to Get Focused, Stop Procrastinating, and Upgrade Your Life. Which, yeah. By the way, talk about three things that we all need to do. We yeah. Get focused, stop procrastinating, upgrade my life. Um, what was the epiphany that you had at that event and, and what, how did it <laughs> Yeah. Matter? So, I mean, I was, uh, it, when, I was at, when we first worked together in Cutco, I, uh, I became a, a, a great sales rep. I became a manager. I ended up running the number one office in the entire country out of 750 of them. And then I, I kind of burnt out and I was over it. So then I started working for other companies and doing sales. And I made like great money for being in my 20s, like more money than all of my friends did. But I was just like so unhappy with life. I was like, this isn't, this isn't like what I want to do. Mm. And, and so the thing that I missed most though, and the thing I loved about being a manager in Cutco is I missed learning about myself and then teaching that to everybody else. So I missed the teaching aspect of it. Like I just like craved it. And so in December 2014, when I went to the the event, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? Like, I'm going to start helping people. I'm going to start coaching people. I'm going to start doing something. I don't know what it looks like, but the thing I miss most is is helping people the th- the same way they used to when I was in Cutco. Yeah. And so about a month later, I was in, I was in uh so that was kind of like in my consciousness. And I was like, I don't know what it looks like, but it's going to come to me. And about a month later, I was in uh, Jason's Deli with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And it was like, it was like a movie scene where like things start to kind of like get real weird as if they're like going to, you know, like they're going to pass out or whatever. Like, we're th- hmm. and, and I, it was like, it was like my life came to like a fever pitch. And it was like, I saw these people in Jason's Deli and they were yelling at their kids. And then everybody seemed like they were overweight and they seemed unhappy and they seemed pissed off. And it, it literally was like, I don't know if I wasn't seeing reality as it actually was. This was like all in my head, but I was, I literally was sitting across from Lauren and I said, I'm going to start a podcast. And then she's like, okay, <laughs> all right. Because I had a microphone, right? And I was like, I could start a podcast. I could do that. I was like, there was something inside of me, which is funny because for people who don't know, I just interviewed you for, for my podcast. And what you said about the Miracle Morning is that you felt obligated to teach mm. it. I actually felt obligated to start a podcast because I felt like I had all of this knowledge that had helped me go from you know getting over my father's death, being an alcoholic as a kid, to starting to work on myself, making my mindset better. And I was like, I feel obligated to teach this to people. Yeah. And there was no money in podcasting back then. They weren't big. It was really hard to find out how to listen to a podcast. I was like, I'm just going to start it. And so I started it. And uh, that was uh, August of 2015. So we're eight, eight years now. I think, by the way, they call that a calling, right? Yeah. When you yeah. feel like called, like I, I have a response. I have to For share sure. this with people. I have to help people. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't make any sense logically in my head yeah. to, <laughs> to quit my job and do podcasting and coaching and stuff, right? It didn't make any sense logically, but it felt right. Like yeah. it felt like it was the thing. Wow. And uh, and so I followed it and it started growing. And now it's at, you know, we're about to hit 300 million downloads of the podcast. It's the number one mindset podcast in the entire world. And the name of the podcast? The Mindset Mentor. The mindset mentor. Yeah. And so, uh, and then 300 from, million downloads. Yeah. 300 million. Incredible. Yeah. We do, uh, well, we do at this point in the next 12 months, we'll probably do about 100 million a, a year, is is where we're at. So mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of like fast forwarding, it's going to be at a billion pretty soon. I'm like, it's just, it's crazy to think of, of what it's become. And it just came from 
sitting in Jason's deli and being like, I feel like I have to do this thing. Yeah. I can't tell you often I meet people that are like, Hey, I listened to Rob Dial's podcast and like he mentioned you or he <laughs> really? mentions you or I mention you pretty often. Yeah, I do. <laughs> the one of the things I, I always, I say the, the quote I say probably the most from you is actually, it's probably changed around a little bit, but yeah. you said it just a minute ago in, in, in the interview that I had with you, which is your, um, your stress and anxiety will be in direct proportion to how much you resist the way that the world is. Mm. And it's just like, when people get that, they're like, oh, I'm creating the stress and anxiety yeah. in my life. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so you are, your first book mm -hmm. just came out. Mm -hmm. It's called Level Up. Yep. Again, it's Stop Procrastinating. Uh, no, Get Focused. How to Get Focused, Stop Procrastinating, and Upgrade Your Life. Yeah. Um, let's just start with why, why the book, why now? Because here's, before, before you answer the question. Yeah. Years ago, yeah. you and I were talking about you writing a book. I'm like, you are such a wealth of knowledge. You've got yeah. such a huge community that would support this book. Yeah. Um, and I introduced you to my agent, mm -hmm. Celeste Fine and John Moss, who are two yes. of the most beautiful human awesome beings people. on the planet. Um, and uh and yeah, and then and then now your first book, Level Up, is finally coming out. So how did we get from there to here and, and yeah. why now? Well, so I'm like you where I'm not, I'm not a really good writer. I'm a great speaker, is what I mm -hmm. like. That's my format. And you say it, you're like, man, writing's hard for me. Yeah. So like for me to sit down and write an email is like tough. For me to sit down and go, I'm going to write an entire book is like, mm, it's yeah. such an undertaking. But I felt like for a long time, people have asked me like, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? And it just didn't feel ready. And then at some point in 2020, it was the summer of 2020, I was like, I kind of feel like, th I, I guess the best way of this is like, I've, I'm like ready to give birth to something. I'm ready to give birth to this thing. And so I remember I called you specifically and I was like, hey man, I'm thinking about writing a book. You have one of the most successful self-published books that's ever existed. Should I do self-published or should I do traditional? And you're like, honestly, you should do traditional. If it was anybody else, I'd probably say self-published. But you should do traditional. And we started talking about the reasons why. And uh, you're like, I'll connect you with my agent, John, and you can just see how it feels. And I was like, all right, cool. And um, so I had a call with John and uh, and then I was like, yeah, this does seem like... you know, It was like, it was like, I didn't know. There's so much unknown. And then I had a call with him and I was like, okay, I feel like there's a little bit more known. And I could, I feel like I kind of, this path is a little bit more lit. And I was like, I'm, I feel kind of comfortable going this way. And then the same day that I, that I talked with John, I, uh, I called up Jay Shetty and I was like, Hey, his book had just come out that year. And I was like, why did you go traditional instead of self-published? And he started telling me the reasons why. And I was like, okay, I feel like it's lighting up a little bit more. And, um, and then what happened was I, I was like, okay, I'm going to write this book. So I literally sat down and it's me writing it with my writers and we're we're going through and figuring out like with the team uh what's it going to look like and so i wrote an entire this one thing i haven't told you i wrote an entire book and then i was i was on a flight from austin to sedona reading like the, the shell of it the draft you know and uh i was going there for a team event we had like 15 of our team members out there and lauren my wife is like what's wrong and I was like, I fucking hate it. And I was like, I was, she's like, really? And I was like, it doesn't f like one of the things that, that I, I concentrate a lot in the podcast is the flow mm -hmm. of like when you give a speech, like you're a professional speaker too. Yeah. It has to flow. Like yeah. it has to feel like I'm taking them on a journey. journey. And there wasn't like a journey that was really there. And so I was like, I need to redo everything. I'm just going to start back at nothing. And so we have our team event. I'm like, Lauren, I'm going to rent an Airbnb and I'm just going to stay for an extra week by myself and just try to crank out as much as I can. And so Sedona is like this incredibly magical place. Yeah. So I rented a place that was... In, I was be, me by myself, but I wanted the best view I could get. And I got this place that was like 8,000 square feet. It was huge. <laughs> I thought you? it was... Yeah, for me, by myself. Like uh, I didn't go to one part of the house because it was so creepy. I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, when you're by yourself in a huge place, you're like it's got to be haunted, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, so... But every morning I would wake up and I would disconnect from my phone. I would check in and then I'd just be done for the day. And I was like, I'm going to see what comes to me. And I was like, what do I, what do I do? Like, what is it that I teach? And, and what I realized is like with the mindset mentor, it is literally, it is number one, how to understand yourself, how to understand your mind. And then once you understand yourself, how do you take action to create the life that you want? And I didn't want to write like a self-help book. Like I didn't want it to be self-help and corny and all this stuff. Like I want it to be like actual strategies to get stuff done. And I was like, man, like if you look at my entire catalog of 1300 podcast episodes, a lot of it is just like, tips and tricks to get yourself to like go from zero to 10 miles an hour, mm. like just get moving in the yeah. right direction. And so I was like, okay, I think most of what I do is actually taking action. And so the, the first title was take action. And then we realized that's not really a sexy title, yeah. you know, but that's really what it's all about. about so there's generic self-help is right. Get, yeah. Right. That's it. <laughs> but it's also like when you're in sales, right? You don't sell the plane flight to Hawaii. You, you sell the vacation. And so mm. it's like, 
to level up sounds yeah. a lot better than take action, right? Sure. So people are going to look and be like, nah, fuck it. I don't yeah, want to take, take action. action. <laughs> so that was, uh, so that was it. And then, so I, I was like, okay, so let's think about taking action. And it was, so it's three parts. Part one is why you don't take action. Part two is how to take action. And part three is, is actually a lot of neuroscience, um, which Richard Schuster actually helped me. He's a neurologist and, and he, uh, went through and literally, helped me. I hired him as a consultant to go through and make sure that everything was factually, scientifically, neurologically oh, wow. fact in the book, okay. which is actual strategies talking about, you know, dopamine reward systems and talking about, um, the, the acetylcholine in your brain and how to change it neuro with neuroplasticity. And so it's like very deep science mm. and fact for the analytical mind. Uh, so it's why you don't take action, how to take action, and then how to actually make action stick through, uh, through reward systems and creating habits and neuroplasticity. Got it. So why you don't take action? The, uh, you know, this is the Achieve Your Goals podcast. Yeah. And obviously you got to take action to achieve your goals. In fact, yeah. I was listening to one of your podcasts on the way down here. Yeah. Uh, and it was all about that. It's like, if you don't do anything, nothing's going to change, right? I mean, it's nothing. Day one stuff. Yeah. Um, but the, let's start there. Like yeah. what holds people back from, and you can answer either of these. Here, here's two ways to answer the question. What holds people back from either from achieving their goals or yeah. what holds them back from taking action or any blend of those yeah. two, right? The relation to it. Yeah. So there's the first thing that I talk about in the book is actually your identity. And which I think is probably the most important thing for someone to actually start to think about. If if I go, I want to lose weight and I'm 50 pounds overweight, but um, and I have a friend whose parents are like this. I've talked to them before and, and they're like, Yeah, well, you know, our family is just all overweight. It's yeah. in our genes, right? And so if I have the programming that it's in my genes that I'll always be overweight, and that's part of my identity, like that's the basis, the foundation of who I am, why would I ever take any action to try to achieve the goal of losing weight? Yeah. And so I think that for a lot of people, it's like it's actually questioning like who you actually think that you are. So identity is is a huge, huge piece of it. And then the other side of it is fears. And so I started doing a whole lot of research on fears and found out that humans only have two innate fears that are built into them. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. Everything else is learned. Hmm. Everything else is learned. So then you start thinking, well, what fears do I have? Because it's learned in some sort of way. Hmm. And, um, And then what I do is I take fears and I actually break them down into two different types of fears. And uh, I got this from a friend of mine who uh, went and lived with a native Brazilian tribe in Brazil, which took two day long boat trip to get to them. Like no roads, like they're remote, remote. And he was lived with them for 40 days. And um, he was, he, it was really interesting as we had this conversation and he had to have a machete with him all the time. Cause he's like, you never know when something's like, wow. if you see a Jaguar, it's been wow. watching you for a long time. He's like, you know, you sleep with it. You're, it's with you at all times. Like it's that remote, like yeah. tribal, right? Yeah. And um, he said, what was really interesting about it though? He looked me dead in the eye and he goes, no, like not one person in that entire place has depression. And he, and so we started talking about why that is. And he said, he said, we, we put in two distinctions and they have primal fears, which is like, you know, getting attacked by a jaguar, yeah. uh, you know, uh, anaconda he went anaconda hunting with them like an anaconda killing somebody right so those are primal fears which is death is attached to it yeah and then on the other side of it what we have here is because we don't have to worry about primal fears is we we create something that i i created it's it's called intellectual fears yeah every fear that we have that does that does not have death or pain attached to it is just an intellectual fear which means it is a it is a complete fabrication of your mind. Yeah. And that's what usually guides our entire life is these fears of like, oh, well, I want to start a business, but you know, if I start putting videos on Instagram, everyone's going to judge me. That's an intellectual fear. There's no pain and there's no death that could possibly be attached to it. And so what happens is I think a lot of people don't take action because either number one, their identity doesn't line up with the person that they want to become. And so you can't shift it if you think like, this is who I'll be forever. Or number two, they're creating some fears that are fake that don't actually truly exist in reality. And one of the things that's important about about when your fears is we as humans are so incredible where we can think something and immediately feel it in our body. Mm. And so we can feel as if the event is already happening. And so for a lot of people, like the, an example I give inside of the book is, is, you know, if you're, if you're dreaming and you're walking through a forest and you're, you see this tiger cross in front of you and you, you freeze for a second and you actually just sit there. And then you see that its head turns and it starts running after you and you start running. We've all had these like crazy dreams, right? You start running and you're like trying to get away from it. And you're running and you're looking over your shoulder and you see that it's getting closer because it's so much faster. And then you turn your head and you look over and it's just about to bite you. And then boom, you wake up and you're like, 
<laughs> you're like, you're what's crazy about it is you're you're out of breath, your yep. heart rate is up, yep. you're sweating. Nothing happened except for you just imagining this mm. thing. And so that's how we are with our fears. We imagine these futures and create the feeling in our body in the present moment. And then when you feel that feeling of this future that you don't want of being rejected or being, you know, someone saying that you're not good enough or smart enough or pretty enough or your parents saying that, you know, you went to school to be an engineer. Why would you want to be a motivational speaker? Whatever it might be, we're feeling those feelings inside of us. And when you feel, don't feel good, taking action is one of the hardest things to do. Yeah. So how do you change that? How do you, I know you've talked about you, like you're big on visualization and envisioning. You mentioned uh-huh. if you, if you are in fear of a, a horrible scenario that mm-hmm. you're making in your mind, um, how do you overcome that? And, and, and do you use visualization? To do it? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was actually listening to, and this is in the book as well. I was actually listening to, um, I can't remember who it was, but when I was in Sedona, what I would do is when I, I would write as much as I possibly could. And then I would just listen to, um, different spiritual teachers or whatever it, it was that I was on at that point, whether it was identity, it was kind of like Alan Watts and spirituality. And then when it was neurology, it was Andrew Huberman and all this stuff. And I would go for a drive and just listen. And, and I remember one of the things that this this guru, the spiritual... is it, I remember it was an Indian guru that was talking and... God, I wish I could remember the name. I don't even know if I know who the person was. But he said it was how to overcome fear. And it was this whole thing. And, and it was like a light bulb moment where I had to like turn off the music and turn off his him speaking and be like, holy shit, this is crazy. And the whole idea of how to overcome fear is that you don't overcome fear because it doesn't actually exist. Mm-hmm. And you can't overcome something that doesn't exist. Interesting. And so the only problem that we have in our life are the problems that we're creating. Mm-hmm. And so the whole idea of fears don't exist, if you can remind yourself, because we're like, we, we almost always feel like we have to have something that we're combating as humans. Like, well, I need to have a, I need to beat this fear. I need to conquer these fears. And it's like, actually the fears aren't even really there because the only fear that actually truly exists inside of you is the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling, which means that everything else is learned, which means if it's learned, it's not actually real. I can't physically hold on to it. If it's not, if it's not going to kill me, then it doesn't actually truly exist. And so one of the things I always tell people is like, what if you just went on the journey of whenever a fear pops up, you go, is this real? No, it's not real. Okay. Well, Move then on. I can keep going. I can just keep <laughs> yeah. moving on. Yeah. And then so what happens is when we're talking about the, the, the visualization side of it is we're usually visualizing the future that we don't want. And we're creating those feelings inside of us at all points in time. And I know for you, visualization is part of savers. So sure. it's like huge for you. And so for me, what, the way I really got good at visualization was uh, in January 1st, 2017, my goal, and I put it everywhere, was I wanted for myself and Lauren to move to Italy for six months. And that was everywhere. That's my number one goal. If nothing mm-hmm. else happens, that's what I've wanted. And I want to be there by July 1st, 2017. Naturally, fear came from that because I was like, I just bought a house. I have a brand new business. My girlfriend at the time, who's not my wife, she was still working for somebody else. So she had to figure out a way to make money. And I was like, uh, and so it's all the feelings of like, I, this can't happen. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to Like, this is fucking crazy. How are we going to do this in six months? I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this happen. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to visualize it. So I woke up and I was like, I'm going to start visualizing Ju- uh, July 1st, 2017. And I want to live in Rome. And so I started visualizing it and started feeling a little bit better about it. And I was like, man, how can I make this? How can I make myself more excited? So I actually went onto uh, a, a Facebook group that was called Expats in Rome and I joined it. And I started, I started reading people who lived in the United States who moved over to, to Rome yeah. and what their life was like. And they lived in different neighborhoods. I found out there's these different neighborhoods. So I put a post up in there and I was like, hey, um, this is what my girlfriend and I are into. We don't really party anymore. We like food. We don't want to be around where it's too busy. Where should we move to? And I looked at all these different places. And the one that kept popping up was this, this neighborhood in Rome called Tristavery. And um, I was like, cool, let me look up Tristavery and see what it looks like. And it looks like you would imagine like an old like Roman town would look like, right? Nice. But it's in Rome. It's actually in right outside the center of it. And um, and so I was like, all right, let me Google it. And I Googled it and I started looking. I clicked on Google Maps and I started like seeing everything and like looking around in Google Maps. And I was like, wait, what if before I visualize, I go on Google Maps every single morning and actually see it? Mm. And so then I started doing that. I tried to visualize what I was seeing and trying to feel into it. And I, and I was like, it started getting deeper and deeper. And I was like, what if I find a coffee shop and imagine myself walking to that coffee shop every single morning? So then I found an area, like a coffee shop that was in a, in a, a square. 
And I, I saw it there and I saw that there were tables outside. So I was like, okay, now I can see, like, mm. I can't, I'm, I'm not making it up in my head yeah, anymore. I'm actually seeing a real, seeing thing, that, a real yeah, thing. Yeah. And I, and it gave me more context. And I was like, okay, I did that for a couple of weeks. And I was like, hold on. I'm visualizing myself drinking coffee. I drink coffee in the morning anyways. What if I just close my eyes and visualize myself walking there and then I hold on to my cup of coffee and I actually drink the cup of coffee. Nice. So I'm smelling it, I'm tasting it. And I was like, oh, all right, so hold on. I've got almost all of my senses. The last <laughs> one I don't have is hearing. So I actually found this thing on YouTube. It's called like the sounds of Rome. So I would put, this is every wow. morning, Hal, wow. every single morning I would wake up and I would visualize myself. I'd put on my headphones so it sounded like the streets of Rome. I'd have my cup of coffee in my hand. I would look at Google Maps first and I would watch you know, the road that I was going to walk down. And so what I would do is I would close my eyes and I would see myself walking there. I would feel myself sitting in the chair outside. I would feel that, I, that what I started doing was actually going outside because it was outside and sitting in the sun. So I'd feel the sun on my skin. Mm. I'd feel the cup of coffee in my hand. I would smell it. I would taste it. I would hear it. I would, it was Every aspect was just in it. It wasn't just trying to visualize. It was like all five senses in it. I got so excited to get there. Yeah. I was like, Lauren, we got to fucking go. We got to, <laughs> we've got to go there soon. Like we have to be like, and so it went from fear yeah. to hardcore excitement. Wow. And when that hardcore excitement starts happening, we were talking about manifesting before, uh, before the podcast started, it was just like things started lining up very quickly. And so the goal is to be there by July 1st, 2017. We were there June 1st, 2017. We were there a month early. Wow. And so the the visualization is in the book where of like, how can you bring as many of your senses into making it real? Because all too often we're guided by our fears and our limiting beliefs. When I want to be guided by like my visualization of what is possible and what I want. And how can we bring all five senses into doing that every single morning is, is what I think people should focus on. I love that, man. I wish I would have heard that story before I published the new edition of the Miracle <laughs> Morning because that is like one of the best visualization stories that I've heard. Thank you. Um, yeah, and look at what it's doing, right? Like you said, rather than li- waking up every day and going living in fear, you're, you're going to be proactive. It's not yeah. like, act, it's not just closing your eyes for a second. Like you were literally, you were hearing it, you were seeing it. And it reminds me, you know, you mentioning like going to Google Maps and actually looking at a real street, a right. real coffee shop mm-hmm. where you want to be. When I was, when I first learned visualization, it was, I was training for the ultra marathon mm-hmm. and I hated running and I had a total fear that I'm like, what, what am I doing? I've never run a mile. How am I going to run 52 miles? Yeah. And, um, but so I printed out, it wasn't quite as vivid as yours, but I, right, but I, but I went and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to be running the Atlantic city marathon twice mm-hmm. in a row. And so I, I printed out the finish line. Mm. Right. And so then every day I would at least, you know, I'm looking at this is the actual finish line and I would close my eyes and I would like create this mental movie of me running and crossing that, you know, of course I wasn't the first one that actually broke through the, but that's what yeah. I pictured, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you, cross. like you want it. <laughs> like I won. Yeah. I was the first or they one. just set up a new finish for you to break for, for through. When it was my yeah. turn. Yeah, yeah. Set me up a new finish. Y'all. <laughs> um, right. But, but, but what that did is, yeah, is it became real like yeah. every day, like this is really going to happen. Right. And that's what I say is the benefit of visualization is you go from being afraid that it won't happen to now you're visualizing it, you're embodying it into your example of the nightmare that you have your mind, your subconscious, your body doesn't know the difference between something that is real, right. unreal, or vividly imagined, like right. that tiger chasing you. Yeah. And so when you vividly right. imagine Italy, it's real now, 100%. and you're excited. And then to your point, I think there are cosmic, unknown, unexplainable woo-woo forces yeah. that seem to start to line up. You 100%. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That was going to say, and, and if people don't believe of like, oh, well, when I imagine something, I feel it inside of my body. Think about the last time you had a you had a sexual thought. Your body starts changing immediately, yeah. right? So it's like you can be guided by fear, you can be, but but it's like your body reacts to what you are imagining inside of your head. Yeah. And so it's like I don't want to be guided by fear, yeah. and that I think that's the most important thing people decide is like I will no longer be my life will no longer be guided by fear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I recently we were talking also before we started recording about how we're both going through book launches. Yeah. And it's one of the most stressful times of it's our so, lives. Super stressful. It's so yeah. stressful. There's so much fear. There's so much yeah. overwhelm. Um. And yeah, it kind of hit me the other day that you know when we live that way, it's like our you know, I'm, I'm no neuroscientist, right? But our limbic system, our subconscious, it's bombarded and it, it takes a, a um, cumulative mm. toll mm-hmm. on our nervous system, right? And so, you know, the, the way you're talking about visualization and the other level up practices, it's like really putting yourself, deciding, do I want to live a life based on fear or yeah. be pulled forward by what could be possible? And yeah. it may or may not work out the way I want to, it might work out better, mm-hmm. but I'm pulled by that vision versus something else. Something else you talk about in the book is you, you call it living in the headlights. Yeah. 
Um, and this is somewhat contradictory to like vision, right? Like your yeah. long-term vision. It's like, right. no, you say, don't live 10 years in the future, live in the headlights, right? Mm-hmm. Live in the now. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about that. What, what, unpack that concept. Well, so one thing that I found, first off, I, I am really big into visualization. I'm really big into goal setting. But one thing that was really surprising to me this came to me a couple of years ago is that I realized that most people, not most people, a, a lot, a very large percentage of people, especially if you're a, a planner or a very analytical person will go, I'm going to make my 10 year goal. And they make their 10 year goal. And then they get paralysis by analysis because all 10 years, all 3,650 days and what has to be done immediately flows into their head. Mm-hmm. And they're just mm-hmm. like, I don't do anything because it's yeah. all of this. And yeah. so there's there's the goal of of looking very long term of like what's my north star in life like what is the guiding light that I'm going to be following and so if you imagine if you're outside and you go okay I'm going to have a north star and it's obviously nighttime you can see the north star in the distance you don't know how you're going to get from here to that point exactly and so the example I always give is like right now if if I were in Austin and I were going okay I'm going to drive to my friend's uh, Mike's house in Houston and I get inside of my car I will not see the entire route. It just won't happen. Sure. And we we want to see the entire route for our lives. And so if I do though, I'm going to see the next 100 feet in front of my car. And everybody who's listening has probably driven a car at night or been in a car that's being driven at night. You cannot see the next mile in front of you very well, but you can see the next 100 feet that are in front of you. And once you get past those 100 feet, what happens? Well, it the starts to light itself up. And it's, it actually goes back perfectly to what we were talking about with the book was when I, I didn't know the path of, of yeah. writing a book, but I was like, well, what's the next step? And the next step was like, let me just talk with an agent or someone who knows what they're doing. I talked to them and I was like, oh, I feel like, okay, that's, that's like the first hundred feet. And now that I'm here and I have a little bit more knowledge, who should I call? All right, I'm going to call my friend who just got finished with the book. So I called Jay and he's like, well, yeah, I would go traditional. I'm like, okay, here's the reasons why he went traditional. And then John's like, we're going to go ahead and shop your book out to other people and we're going to get you on a calls. And the next, the, the hundred feet kind of built Hundred yeah. feet at a time. It wasn't like I saw the entire like me thinking now three. This all of this started three years ago, summer of two thousand and twenty, and now it's two thousand twenty three. I didn't see the entire path of how to get here, how to write a book, the 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 how to long nights, the early mornings for sure. Yeah, how to get yeah, three hundred million dollars. Yeah. I didn't see any of this stuff. All I did was I said like, what's the best thing for me to do right now? It's like the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and so. When I talk about living in the headlights, it's like, we won't see the entire path and it will never be fully illuminated. And there's going to be detours, there's going to be changes, but like, what's the next hundred feet? And once I get to those hundred feet, it'll eventually illuminate the next hundred feet. So that's why I always say living in the headlights. I love that. And it really, it just reminded me of how, of that, that's how I live. Mm-hmm. And that people would ask like, Hey, did you know this miracle morning? Like that it was going to be this thing? I'm like, no, dude, I, I had no idea. Yeah. And so my point is, I'm like, I'm not very good at thinking far ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just good at doing the next thing yeah. and doing the next thing and doing the next thing. And so that for me, it's always like, I just keep moving forward in a positive direction. Mm-hmm. And, and then I think that and I actually want to hear your opinion on this. Where does faith play into that? And I don't mean yeah. spiritual faith, although there's it's one yeah. and the same, but, but in terms of like faith that if I keep living in the headlights and just doing the next best thing and keep moving forward, eventually like I'm going to be going in a positive direction and I don't know yeah. where I'm going to end up, but it's going to be somewhere awesome. Yeah. I mean, so I'll, I'll talk about the whole faith side of it is I, it's, I've done a lot of work on myself over the past 17 years. I've done some, you know, some journeys and I've done some other things and I've worked with people and I've had coaches and I've invested a lot of money into myself. And I've had many things not happen the way that I want them to, right? Like I can look back to like having an alcoholic father. That's not what I wanted when I was a kid. Having my dad pass away when I was 15 from being an alcoholic, not what I want as a kid. Um, many failures along the way, not what I wanted. But now that I'm 37 years old and I can look back, yeah. I'm, I can go, all of those worked out exactly how they were supposed to. Mm. And so for me, when we're looking at like the idea of the North Star, where it's like, I at least have taken a step back and said, what's important to me? Who do I want to be? How do I want to operate in this world? What do I want my life to look like? And that's, that's my North Star. I know that I'm not going to get everything that I want, but I will get everything that I need. And so I actually really do trust in God, in the universe, that as long as I'm lined up, and I have many examples throughout my life, as long as I'm lined up with what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing, everything will work out exactly as it's supposed to. And, you know, I I, I said this the other day, yesterday on a podcast, but like one of my one of my wife's fears is uh, that I'm going to get so big because everything's been growing so fast and it's been like not expected. That uh, eventually my my safety could come in danger, right? Because mm. there's some crazy people out there. Oh, yeah, 
I completely understand her fear. But I've, I've said, if that's what happens to me, that's what happens to me. But I'm not going to not follow the path that I feel like I was made for in this world simply yeah. out of the fear that something might happen in the future, which probably won't. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a re really good way to put it. Um, the, I want to unpack the subtitle of your book mm -hmm. because I think there's just really powerful lessons in there that you are an expert at. Mm -hmm. um, it's how to get focused. Okay. We yep. need help with that. Yes. Um, how to stop procrastinating. <laughs> yeah. One of the biggest killers of dreams, right? Yeah. And then how to upgrade your life is kind of the product of, of those first two. Mm -hmm. um, but talk about focus. You are a map. I was actually listening to them into your podcast on the way here. Mm -hmm. And I believe the episode was about like getting focused, increasing your productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned if you don't do anything, obviously, right? You know, yeah. of course you're not going to go forward. But talk about that. How if someone feels like, I think right now I did a podcast a couple weeks ago, uh, or I guess a month ago, how to overcome feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. And I feel like people feel overwhelmed both individually and collectively right now. And mm -hmm. what I mean is collectively ever since 2020 and this, you know, it's like, I feel like the world just feels crazy, right. kind of an out of control. Yeah. And we've, we're seeing more than we knew before. Um, we're, you know, a lot of division between people and, and so on and so forth. So there's this global collective overwhelm of like, what, what is, what is the future of the world going to look like? For right. Sure. But there's the individual overwhelm, which is like, I have so many things to do, not enough time to do them. I have dreams I want to achieve, but I, I, I'm just trying to make it through another day. Mm -hmm. So focus is the knife that cuts through all of that, mm -hmm. right? Cuts through the overwhelm. It's like, well, I'm overwhelmed because I'm trying to focus on 17 different things that make me feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. If I can learn to focus on one thing at a time, I can actually eliminate or transcend the feeling of overwhelm. And now yeah. I can actually feel good that I'm focused and making progress. How do we get there? Yeah. So the the way I one of the things that I get compliments on is I try to make things really simple and really basic. Yes. And the way that I do it is I always take a step back. And so in even in my business, we have 34 employees. If I'm with the executive team, I'm like, okay, here's the goal, but what's the 50,000 foot overview of this thing? And so the same way that I wrote the book of like, it's about taking action. The first thought in my head was, well, why don't people take action? Yeah. And that's where the first part of the book came from, part one came from, right? So then what happens is if we look at focus, my first question is, well, why aren't people focused? And immediately what comes with that is distractions. Mm. And so you can't like teach someone, I'll give you some strategy on how to focus, but I can't teach someone to focus if they're still don't have, if they still they have all these distractions. things that are stopping them from focusing. A hundred percent. So like, I always say like, cell phones are the most incredible piece of technology I think that might have ever existed. I think that people should stop saying the best thing since sliced bread and they should start saying the best thing since cell phones because it's <laughs> revolutionized the world, right? Yeah. The problem though is that we weren't sure, we had no idea that they could they could create apps that would just make us so addicted to them. So yeah. for me, I've realized years ago that my phone was just a massive distraction. So I was like, it's either going to become my life or I'm going to figure out how to master this thing. So not everybody has the means to do this, which I completely understand, but I have two phones. I have a work phone, which I do my work on, and I have my personal phone. And on my personal phone, I don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't have Reddit. I don't have any of those. There's no apps on my phone that could distract me. I need to get a second phone. Right. Keep going. Yes. And so, <laughs> so my, my first or my second phone though is always plugged in at my office. And so if I'm like, okay, cause I, post all the time on Instagram. If I'm like, I need to create a reel. I need to create, uh, I need to respond to people. I need to put up a story. I'll pick up my phone and I will immediately do it. Or I will literally take a video. If I'm, if I'm out and I have a great idea and I'm like, I want to put this on a story, I'll take the video and I'll send it to my head of social media and she'll post it for me. Mm -hmm. So I understand that not everybody has that means, but, but for me, that was just the way that I did it because of the fact that I wanted to distance myself from it. Yeah. And so I think it's a, important to be like, what are my distractions? For some people, it might be social media. For some people, it also might be their TV. And so uh, one of the things I say inside the book is that every room in your house, the entire environment is going to help you do something. W what that something is, you have to figure out. So like the kitchen, you know, if we were saying, what's the number one thing that people do in the kitchen? Eat. So that's what it's, it facilitates and helps you do. Mm. If I say to you, you know, it, what's your living room built towards? 99.9% .9 of living rooms I've walked in, where do the couches face? A TV. TV. Yeah, sure. So what is that room designed to do? To watch TV. And so if someone's watching too much TV, you either change the room or you change the room, you either change the actual physical room or you change the room that you're in. And so for me, if, if somebody lives at home, they're 30 years old and they're like, I, I'm trying to build my business, but I really want to figure out a way to stop watching so much TV. Take your TV off the wall, put it inside of a room inside of your closet and leave it there for 30 days. 
put books on top of it. Put, if you're trying to build a business, put business books that are on your coffee table. So the only thing that that room is designed to do is to either sit there and stare at the ceiling or you decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna read some business books and that'll help you out. Yep. And so what it's about is, is how do you design an environment that helps you take action because the majority of people don't realize they've designed environments to distract them in some sort of way. And so what really I think people should focus on is how do you design an environment to get free of as many distractions as possible, whatever the distractions are. If there are other people, well, then how do you... <laughs> We've got a dog right now that is uh, cut this part. joining the interview. Come here. Yeah. He need, Bear needs some love. We got a tiny dog that's sitting here. Tiny dog. So... If you look at every room is designed to do something, what are all of your rooms designed to do? I was watching a, an interview one time and one of the things that was best is they said the people who have the most willpower are not... And the people who have the most willpower and are the most consistent are not people who are born that way, but people who have designed their environment not to test their willpower. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, that's so true because mm. I love anything with sugar in it. Okay. I'm like a crackhead when it comes to sugar. Like if I have some sugar, I have to have all of the sugar, Got right? It. Okay. So I can't have sugar in the house. Mm. And I just know that about myself because I'll finish an entire thing of Skittles. I'll finish yeah. everything. And so it's like, I've designed my environment to help me with the goal of not eating yeah. the, the sugar. And yeah. so that's the first thing is how do you design your environment to do so as far as distractions? Now you can also design your environment to help you take action too. There's a bunch of really cool things that, that happen when you actually start to look at somebody neurologically. And so what happens is, is your mental focus follows your visual focus. And so what happens is for the average person, if you're going to sit down and do something, it takes about six minutes for your brain to warm up. So if you're going to go into a gym, right? It takes you, you got You're not just going to go and lift your, your best every single time. You're going to warm up and then you're going to go lift. Okay. And so what happens is the first six minutes for people is usually the hardest six minutes. And so when you sit down to do something, I recommend using the Pomodoro technique. I've recommended this over and over, like hundreds of times because I've never found anything better, okay. which is 25 minutes on of just work on one thing and one thing only and five minutes off. Yep. There's a whole lot of research behind why this works. And, and that's also in the book. But you take 25 minutes, you say, I'm going, if you have slides that you have to create for a presentation for work tomorrow, you sit down, you give yourself only 25 minutes to do that, free of as many distractions. You get on it, get to a desk that has nothing on it except for your computer, an external monitor, and a light. And I'll tell you why that why that all of that's important in a second. So the only thing that you can do is either just stare at your screen or you can get the presentation done. Mm. You turn off all of your notifications. Those are more distractions that are that I talk about, right? Yeah. So you turn off all of your notica- notifications. You put your phone in another room so you can't resist. You, there's no urge to go pick it up. And then you go, all right, I've got six minutes that I know it's going to take for my brain to warm up. And I, when I was writing the book, it was so funny because I was doing these and I was noticing myself being the guinea pig in this book, right? Sit down to write and be like, damn, I don't want to write right now. Like I've yeah. got so many other things to do. I've got a business. Block. I've got, I don't I, want to write right. And so really what it takes is I was like, but what did I say in the book? Write for six minutes. Just start writing something for six minutes. Yep. You know, write for six minutes. It just starts coming out of it me does. a lot easier, yeah. right? And so what happens is you sit down, you give yourself no distractions. You tell yourself it's going to take about six minutes for my brain to warm up and mental focus follows visual focus. And so what you want to do is you want to stare at the screen for about a minute if that's about how far it's going to be. So if you're you're needing to get work done, you stare at the screen, you watch a blinking cursor and try not to blink your eyes for as much as possible. And you sit there and you stare because what happens is you're trying to take your peripheral vision and actually try to imagine that you're looking through like a paper towel roll and put it to just this little area that's right in front of you. When I wrote the book, I actually wrote the book a lot of times with a hat on and a hood over like a hoodie on so that there was no sides that my brain could see on the other side Mm -hmm. because I'm actually visually telling my brain, this is the only thing that we're working on right now. Mm. And there's no distractions on the outside. There's nothing else that I could see. And this is what we're focusing on. And then what I would usually do is I have a cup of coffee while I was doing it. And I would get into levels of focus that I've like never had before in my entire life. So I'm I'm writing the book based off of what I know happens, all of this research, and I'm trying all this research as I'm actually doing it. And I went from 25-minute sessions to 45 minutes straight of just hardcore focus on this thing only. And one of the things that helps with it is that your brain, it's really interesting. Is so your eyes are, you know, connected to your brain, obviously. And if you're looking straight ahead, like straight ahead, and imagine that there's a line. When you look down, which is how most of us look at our computer, we look down at our computers or we look down at our phones, yeah. there's actually a part of your brain that it clicks on that tells your body to start being relaxed. And so we're working 
looking down almost all day long, which is telling us to start to relax. Hmm. But what's interesting is that when you look above the center of your visual field, and so this is why I always recommend you have an external monitor, and it's just a little bit up like this. Number one, it's better for your spine to do it that way. And you're looking, it's actually telling your brain to be more alert. On top of that, the the most important thing you could do, you could walk into to either one of the two offices that I work at all all the time, is right above my screen of my external monitor is always a really bright light. And the reason why is because the bright light actually mimics the sun and your brain has mm. these things that are that that are on the there are these receptors on the bottom sides of on the bottom of your eyes they're called the ba- basal basal gang- I don't want to screw it up but I probably <laughs> will basal ganglion cells that are I think I was actually right on that that are on the bottom side of your eye that look up that that search for basically the sun to tell your brain to either be alert or to be fo- or to be tired mm. and so if you can remember light above your eyes a little bit doesn't you don't want to be blinding or anything like that. And then a screen that you're looking at that's a little bit above your slightly, the, the, elevated. slightly elevated above your normal visual field, it's actually telling your brain, wake up, mm. get focused. And if you can try to narrow your visual field and only give yourself one thing to focus on, you can focus on it. And I always tell people, you might be terrible at it the first day, but just keep doing it and show up and keep doing it and show up and you'll get so much better at it. And you'll notice you can go 25 minute sessions. Like it might be a struggle to get to 25 minutes. Yeah. Do this for a month. And you'll notice you're at like 30, 35, 40 minutes of just hardcore focus. And if you can get a couple of those sessions done a day, yeah. you're light years ahead of the other person. Yeah. Yeah. I call I the Pomodoro technique, the 25, five off. Yep. I, I used, before I knew what that was, I created this strategy when we were in Cutco called half hours of power. Mm-hmm. And it was the idea that we, you know, I got to make phone calls for like an hour or two. Like, I don't want to, it's such a, you know, it's just, and then you'd end up dilly dallying like, you know, in one hour you'd end up make a call and then you'd like get distracted and do something mm-hmm. else. And what I did is I gamified it where I go, okay, half hours of power. So I have to make calls for 30 minutes, as many calls as I can possibly make. Mm-hmm. And then I earn a, and it would be a five or a 10 minute break. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was like, yeah, it was just, it was the laser focus and, you know, head down, head up, whatever. Um, and for the 30 minutes and then getting the calls and it was, I would set a number of, okay, I need to get this many calls done. So I was racing, trying to get to that target. Mm. Um, and I'd already measured like how many calls can I get done in half an hour if I'm pretty much on point the whole time. Yeah. So I was like, and I was telling, okay, check. Okay. I'm at, I'm at eight. I'm at eight. Right. And like, the thing is your, my brain, it's like your brain, instead of focusing on all the different things like distractions, you're like, I have to get this many calls done to earn my break. Cause if I didn't get that many calls done in the 30 minutes, I didn't get to take a break. I had to keep going and I almost always get it, get it done. Mm-hmm. But, but anyway, the point being like, um, actually the point and the question is when with the five minute break on the, using the Pomodoro technique, yeah. uh, what do you do with that? Time? So, I'm so glad you brought this. Cause I wanted yeah. to say it. Cause okay. I was like, as you were saying it, I was like, shit, I hope we don't change. Like there's something really important here <laughs> because here's what happens is most people, what we do is then we go to our phones. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And okay, the problem with that is that you're still, you're still using a narrow visual field. And so, um, what happens is, is there's, there's, uh, it's called vergence eye movement. So convergence means your eyes go from like, if I'm looking out in the distance outside across the street, my eyes are basically like this. When I'm looking at something right here, my eyes have to converge a little bit, Mm -hmm. which like they basically cross is the way it would be. And so, and then there's divergence, which is like kind of looking out towards the side. When you're looking at something that's very close, your brain is still, your, your eyes are still telling your brain it's time to focus. And so looking at your phone is one of the worst things that you could do. Mm. Here's what you do though. If you're, if you're studying or if you want, like if I wish I would have known this in college, I didn't study in college anyways, and I dropped out. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter, I guess. But, but for people who are listening and they're in college, th- this is like amazing for you to do is studying. If you're trying to, if you're reading a book or you're trying to get better at like a specific skill set. What you want to do is if you're, let's say you're, let's use playing guitar as an example, right? Someone's like, okay, I want to learn this, this guitar phrase. And they sit down and they play guitar. The worst thing that you could do after that 25 minute session, whatever it is of dedicated practice, whether it's studying, whether it's playing guitar, whether it's creating slides, any of that stuff, the worst thing you could do is look at your phone because you're, you're still telling your, your brain through what you're looking at that it needs to focus. What you want to do is the exact opposite. So if you imagine a hardcore mm-hmm. workout, what do you need? You need rest. Your brain goes through something when you fall asleep called through your hippocampus. It's called hippocampal replay, which is where it actually replays your entire day. That's why you can have dreams about what happened. Mm. When you're asleep, it can go anywhere between 50 to 60 times faster in more replay. So it'll replay it 50 to 60 times over and over. And that's how you create the repetition to make it a long-term memory. What's interesting though, is when you take a five-minute break, 
the best thing that you could do is close your eyes and do absolutely mm. nothing because your brain goes into hippocampal replay. And even though you're awake, it restores it 20 to 30 times faster. So it's not as much as when you're asleep. Yeah. But imagine if, if you're trying to study something, whether it's a sheet music, whether it's something for school, whether it's you know uh, a presentation that you have, and you're trying to memorize, you're trying to memorize, you're trying to memorize, and it's hardcore focus on this thing, and you're trying to store it. The best thing that you can do is take 25 minutes in that five minute break, close your eyes, and then just allow your brain to do whatever it's going to do, which is storing it back over again. And so just allow your brain to do it. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do if you want to do something active is to go for a walk or to go out and look at a landscape. So for Mm -hmm. me, a lot of times what I'll do in my breaks when I was writing the book, you know, I'd, I'd sit there and write the book is I would take five minutes and I would go outside. So the sun was still out. So my brain could see the sun was still out. It would tell my brain to focus. And I would look out at the trees because then my eyes go from from looking at something that's real close and focused and divergence eye movement to now I'm taking in my perimeter again. And it tells your brain to actually start to relax and replay all of that over and over again. So the worst thing someone could do is look at their phone. Okay. The best thing they could do is is some form of relaxation, whether that's uh, yoga nidra, or whether that's meditation, or whether that's just staring off into the distance, allowing your brain to replay and store everything that you just did. I'm so glad that we didn't move on and we got to cover that because yeah. you just changed my life. Because I think that I, I, I do probably, unlike most people, I will go to the phone. Right. Um. And and it's interesting. I never thought about like it seems like such common sense. Like close your eyes for five minutes, almost go into a little midday med- meditation. Yeah. Right. And allow allow your not only for for what's happening to start to embed itself in your subconscious. Um, but yeah, and just to reset, I mean, that, it makes so much sense. And I will occasionally do, I will do the, you know, I'll, I'll walk out, I'll go outside for my mm-hmm. five minutes, whatever, but mm-hmm. I'm sure half the time I grab the phone and then go outside. And, you hey, know. I, I, I used to only go to my phone yeah. after I was hardcore on Pomodoro and I would always go to my phone cause I have a business and I have things I have to yeah, do. And yeah, then yeah. I realized, Oh, like, yeah, I need to put in another room and disconnect. If I'm going to do two Pomodoro sessions, 25 minutes each, that's going to take me an hour. Okay. I'll disconnect from my phone for an hour. I'll let my team know. And then I'll come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, the, all right. So that's the, so the first part of the subtitle, the book is level up. It's how to get focused. The second mm-hmm. part is, and how to stop procrastinating. Yeah. And I want to talk about that because, you know, procrastination, I mean, I've done, I've done podcasts on that. Right. And it's like the first question always is, okay, well, why do you procrastinate? It's like mm-hmm. identify that. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, the simplest answer is because it's always easier to do nothing than it is to do the thing that you need to do, For sure. no matter what the thing is. Yes. It's always easier to do it, Way to not do it, than to do it, right? So that's the yeah. simplest reason you're going to procrastinate. And then you can dig deeper into, well, it's fear. It's, yeah. you know, you don't enjoy it. It's painful. It's tiring. It's yes. what you don't feel capable of, whatever the reason is. Yes. But it's easier to not do it than it is to do it. So yeah, how do you stop procrastinating? Well, so yeah, what, what you said is actually perfect because I had this, this realization a few years ago. One of my employees was like talking about you know, somebody wanted to join our program, but in, in the thing that they were part, they were dealing with procrastination, and I was like, "You realize that procrastination is never the actual problem. Mm. Everyone thinks procrastination is a problem, but procrastination is the symptom. It's yep. not the cause. Yep. And so, why are they procrastinating? Is what it, if if I were to say, "Hey, if you do exactly this thing, I'll give you a million dollars," would anybody procrastinate? on doing exactly what that thing is. If I said, hey, sit down and make 100 phone calls, 100 cold calls, you're going to read this exact script. And if you, as soon as you finish, if you finish in the next uh, seven hours, I'm going to give you a million dollars. Would anybody procrastinate? <laughs> Nobody would procrastinate <laughs> ever, right? right? There's no way. Because they know what they're going to get out of it and they know exactly how much time they have and they know exactly what it is they need to do. And so I think what it comes down to is what we were talking about earlier, which is what fear are you imagining in the future? Mm. And so the the thing that was like, I... I tr- I try to harp on this so much and I don't know if people understand like how important it actually is, but th- it's the feeling of the future that you're imagining you will feel in the present moment. And so like, for instance, if you're a business owner, I coach a lot of business owners. That's like my main thing that I do besides the podcast. Yeah. And so many of them are just afraid of the business failing. And then what's really interesting about it is the thing that they fear the most is usually what they create. And so they're so afraid of the business failing that they don't take any action. And then the business ends up starting to go down the the, the road of failure. And so what happens is I'm sitting here, for instance, I want to build my business to, let's say, $100,000 this year. And then I sit there and I'm, I'm going, well, you know, I've run two other businesses into the ground and I don't know what's going to work out. And I'm going to start taking this action. And what if what if I end up taking, what if I put so much time into this next year and I don't even make enough money to pay my bills? Hmm. And so they're imagining the future that they don't want. They're imagining the future that they fear. 
And most people are imagining a future they don't want. And then they're, they're curious why they can't motivate themselves to take any action. It's because you're actually thinking about a future that you don't want and who would ever want to take action towards a future that they don't want. It doesn't make any sense. Sure. Right. And I saw a video one time on YouTube and it was amazing. It was this guy that had these, this, this lady come up on stage and he's like, okay, there's one chair on the left side of the stage. There's one chair on the right side of the stage. And he goes, okay, sit right there. And I want you to tell me what you don't want in your life. And so she's sitting in the don't want chair and she's like, I don't want this. And I don't want this and this and this. And he's like, okay, what else? What, what do you don't want in your relationship? Oh, I don't want this in my relationship. Okay. What do you, what do you not want in, in your, your money? And, and went through every category you could go to. Right. And she like just firing stuff off. And he goes, okay, cool. Now go to the other one. And he's like, what do you want? And she's like, well, you know, I would like to be happy and I would like this thing and goes on for like 12, 15 seconds. And she goes, but like, I, I don't want my relationships to be this. And she immediately went to don't <laughs> want. And it was like, that's how most people live their like life. Program. We're programmed to think about what we don't want. Mm. And there was a, there was a, a really, a big moment in my life that was a really interesting thing is, is right outside of town here. Um, my friend AJ, it was his birthday. It's like seven years ago now. And we went to go race go-karts like 50 miles an hour. We rented out the entire track. There was like 20 of us. It was awesome. And the guy who, who owned the track and was teaching us was an ex Lama driver. And so he like knew his stuff and he was French and he was funny and he was making all these jokes. And then he got super serious and he's like, you will crash. Somebody will crash. When your friend crashes in front of you, don't look at the crash because you will crash into your friend. Oh wow. And there's a chance you could kill him. Okay. Right. And he was like serious, serious as could be, right? Okay. And he goes, when somebody in front of you crashes, look at where you want to go, mm. not the crash. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, this is everybody's life is we're always looking at the crash uh. and going, why do I keep crashing? We're always looking at the crash. We're thinking, why do we keep crashing? When it's like, we're not looking at that. We're looking at, we're looking at the crash, not where it is we want to go. When you're in, you know, I've never driven a motorcycle, but I've heard this from people who, who follow me is when you're in motorcycle school, they say, look through the turn, mm -hmm. look at where you want to go, because that is where your body will naturally drive you to. It's the same thing with your subconscious and your conscious mind is that your body will naturally drive you to whatever it is that you're focusing on the most. And so I think the problem with procrastination is that people are just imagining what is it they don't want and how could you ever motivate yourself to do something when the future looks like it's going to suck. Yeah. Be hard. Yeah, to me, and that's why when we were talking earlier about why I think affirmations are my favorite of the savers yeah. is because everything that you're talking about is on point. Um, but also what you talked about, we're programmed to look for what's wrong. We're for programmed sure. to live in fear. Of we're course, programmed yeah. to think of life today the way we thought of life yesterday and the day it before. kept our before. species alive. And that's where affirmations are literally, that's where you rewrite the the, the, the plan. You rewrite the blueprint you, mm -hmm. you, you in writing. And it doesn't have to be affirmations. You can call it whatever you want, right? right. It's like, here's how I'm commit, what I want in my life, what's possible. Here, you can even say, here's what I'm afraid of, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on what I want, what's possible. And every day I'm going to, I'm going to visualize that. I'm going to imagine that. I'm going to feel that. I'm going to think about that. Um, I love this. You're so let's go to the third and final part of the subtitle, right? Mm -hmm. The book is level up, how to get focused, stop procrastinating and upgrade your life. Mm -hmm. What, what is the, if you want to leave, uh, our listeners with any wisdom to upgrade their life based on your book, level up, what would that be? Well, read the book, but, <laughs> but, but besides that, I think the that, book and yeah, 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 it's, it's the thing about it is, is I, I was thinking about like creating a title of make your life better or, um, better than yesterday was one of the ones that we went through or 1% better today. And the thing that I want people to understand is this is the, the problem with better and why I didn't go with it is because better implies worse which means that if I'm going to make my life better in the current moment, life, my life is worse than it mm. should be. And that just doesn't make people feel good. Yeah. And so I, the, the whole idea of the book and why it was called Level Up and Upgrade Your Life is because of this, this view, as I was writing it and I was talking to the publisher, they're like, why is that not in the book? And I was like, what? And they're like, this, this frame of your life being a video game. And what, what, I told them, and this is the way I actually see my life, is I see my life the same way I see a video game. Okay. Which is, you know, how first off, how boring would it be to play a video game where there's no challenges? How boring would it be to video game if every day is exactly the same as it was before? You'd stop playing the video game. What makes a video game fun is that you meet a challenge. You meet a new bad guy. 
and you meet that bad guy and maybe you fail a couple of times, but you don't give up. You just keep going and you don't give up and you just keep going. And what happens? You eventually beat the bad guy and you go on to another level. Yeah. And the next level is always harder than the level before it. Sure. But you feel more confident mm-hmm. because you've at least conquered things in the past. And then what happens? A new challenge, a new bad guy comes up and challenges you. And you're instead of going, I'm not going to do this, you're like, okay, I'm going to keep going at it. Oh man, I died again. I failed. And then you go, well, okay, I learned that you know this doesn't work with him. So I'm going to try this thing out. And I learned that this doesn't work. So I'm going to try this thing out. I see life exactly the same. And you know, you asked me a few minutes ago about like, how do I have faith is in, in, in trust in what's happening for me is exactly what's supposed to happen is I actually do view my life as a video game yeah. in, in this way of like every character that comes to me is a character that's supposed to be in my life in some sort of way. God placed them there for a reason. But then when a challenge comes to me, instead of being like, I can't do this, I go, okay, what's the point of this challenge? And how is this challenge going to help me level up? Yeah. How is it going to help me upgrade my mm-hmm. life in some sort of way? And I've realized that I've had, I would never want to go back to any of the most challenging moments in my entire life. I don't want to go back. You probably don't want to go back to trying to walk again. You probably don't want to go back to having cancer. You don't want to have any of those things, but you wouldn't change them because you've learned so much about yourself. You've gotten, you've probably gotten so much closer with your family. You appreciate them more. Your children probably appreciate you more because there was an opportunity where you might not have been there. And so it's like the challenges are never fun, but the challenges are always necessary for us to learn something from it and then for us to be able to grow in some sort of way. Because, you know, it's like the phrase new levels, new devils. It's like more things come with you, right? It's like new things come at you as things, as as you start to grow. And so the, 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 the phrase level up actually came like leveling up your life. Upgrading your life came from like upgrading in a video game. Like I think of like when you used to play, uh, Super Mario Brothers, you know, and you'd, yeah. you'd, you'd get the the mushroom and it would make you bigger. It's yeah. like, that's what I want to be is I don't want to be better, but I want to upgrade myself all the time. I don't want to think that I'm, I'm going to be better in the future because that implies that I'm worse now. I want to think that I'm a more evolved, more expansive, more conscious being. Yeah. And if I can view every challenge that comes through in my life as a way for me to upgrade myself, it makes it easier for me to be like, okay, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to push through because on the other side of this is a better version of me. Yeah. I love that. I love the video game analogy. I'm I'm glad the publisher got you to put it in because it it really does make sense. And yeah, new levels, new devils, right? The challenges get harder, but you get better. Mm -hmm. um, And and such is life, you know? And I think that uh, if you're dealing with challenges right now, anybody listening to this, right? Or watching this, just to realize that what you're going through now is an opportunity for you to learn, for you to grow, Mm -hmm. and for you to level up and become better than you've ever been before. Absolutely. Um, So Rob Dial, man, thanks for writing, finally writing your book. I know, right? (laughs) Man, you are uh, 37 years old and truly wise beyond your years. And for anybody watching, uh, where's the best place to get the new book, Level Up? (sighs) Wherever they want to buy it. It should be everywhere. It's it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's inside of bookstores. So as long as they just, they could go to Google, type in Rob Dial Level Up, and it should pop up and they can order and have it sent directly to them. And it is out. Uh, you're going to be releasing this the week that it comes out. So it is available for people to yeah, buy and have yeah. it sent directly to their house. Yeah. And anybody listening, you know, if you're a podcast listener, which obviously you are, you're listening to this podcast, uh, m- subscribe to The Mindset Mentor. Rob, your podcast, it's one of it's one of the few that I actually listen to. Thanks, man. And it's one of my favorite podcasts. And one of the things I've modeled after you recently, except for this episode, but is shorter. Yeah. Like your, a lot of your episodes, your solo episodes are usually like, you know, 17 minutes, 20, right. they're usually under half an hour and mine will I'll go on for an hour. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, Nobody's still listening. What am I talking about? <laughs> so anyway, so man, it's, it's amazing how the student, I will say like to me, you and I, I really view you as a peer, as Thank a you. mentor, if you will. Thanks, and I feel like it's one of those where the student in many ways has become the teacher. I learn a ton from you. I am really excited to read the new book. Uh, which will be arriving probably probably arrived yesterday when this thing comes out. Yeah. So the book, everybody, is Level Up, How to Get Focused, Stop Procrastinating, and Upgrade Your Life by my good friend, Rob Dial. Grab your copy today and uh, may your life be blessed. Thanks, buddy.